run or take a long time. So one good option is to do an analog test. And an analog test, you simply make representative geometry of the relevant parts, right? Especially if you're doing mechanical testing. So say you have an assembly of, uh, you know, car engine, but you're wanting to test only one piece of it. There's no reason to make the entire engine and test the whole thing. Make just that one piece or even simplify that piece. If you know there's one weak point in it, you could go and reduce that complexity. So a good example uh, from my background, this is called a tibial template. So in a total knee replacement, the surgeon, your tibia is your lower leg bone. They're gonna cut across that bone. And then there's two holes in this template right here. And they put a rod down those and they look to see if that rod is lined up with your leg. And that lets them know that they've got the tilt on the plate correct, okay? So in doing that testing, you could make this entire assembly if you wanted to, but really all you're interested in is the surface area of the plate here and the diameter and length of the hole here. Everything else that happens with the connection between these parts isn't relevant to that test, okay? So what we did was we created a flat plate that had none of the delicate and complex geometry and none of the holes in the handles. We just had these two holes where you drop that rod on a flat plate, right? So we could go and we could do a simulation of the surgery. We could run the test to see if we get an accurate drop of that rod without having to go through and fabricate the whole assembly, which would be expensive and time consuming and wasteful, right? Everybody follow that? So if you have complex parts, simplify them down to just the parts that matter for your test. It can save you a lot of time. Uh, likewise, in software, you can run unit tests. So you don't have to test your entire huge piece of software. Right? If you've written thousands and thousands of lines of code with lots of different functions, um, you can test it one piece at a time. It's a lot easier to understand. And you can do the same thing in mechanical tests. So if you have an engine assembly, you may want to test you know, just one piece of it at a time so that you can understand the failures. Or if you test a big assembly of parts, it can be difficult to know what went wrong. Everybody follow that? So those, those little tests would be verification tests, and the bigger test of the whole engine would be the validation. All right. Uh, another good option is simulation. So have most of you probably heard of finite element analysis? A few shaking yes heads? Okay. <clears throat> if you need help with finite element analysis on your EPICS projects, come find me, or for other projects, I can help you. Um, so there are big and complex software packages like ANSYS or Abacus. Um, they are very powerful for doing simulation. So like you see um, this airplane being put through some kind of uh, a stress test. Where you see red areas typically are high stress or high displacement, whatever you're measuring is, is a high level where the blue would be low. So it's saying, okay, there's a lot of stress happening um, within the engines. So those kind of tests you can run on purely theoretical construct, right? So you create a CAD model and you can import it into the FEA software and run it. Um, this is a good idea whenever you have parts that are too expensive to destroy. So like you've designed a jet, you don't want to destroy it, or it would take you a long time to make another one, or you can't get into the environment, right? If you're designing a submarine and it's supposed to go to a depth that no boat has ever gone before, hard to test that, right? But it's a lot easier to do a simulation. Um, so things like that are helpful with this. It can also be useful during the design process, not just at the end when you're going to say, did my final design work, but to say, okay, I designed this thing. I, I think it will withstand this load. Let me check it real quick. Or I'm not sure where the weak points are. It'll give you an indication as to where those are so you can improve your design up front. So it's very useful to do some simulation. It should approximate the physics of the real situation, and that depends on the material properties that you feed to it. Um, so it's important that you get those correct. And again, if you're going to use those as your final testing, a lot of times you'll have to validate them, which can be a bigger burden than running a physical test sometimes. So there's always a trade-off on that. Um, make sure if you do FEA that you interpret your results with caution. It's really easy to create like point singularities that will have almost infinite stress or infinite load in them that aren't real. Um, so you need to be able to read your results well enough to understand what happened. So if you want to run a test like that, strongly recommend that you run your results by someone who has a lot of expertise or experience doing those kind of simulations to help you find the areas where you went wrong. Um, a good example of that, when I was a, actually a student here at Purdue doing senior design, 
one of our senior design teams had designed a system that's supposed to read um, the electrical signals off of muscle movements and move like a robotic arm in response. And they're having a really hard time and they finally went, took their results to one of our faculty members and they said, these are all noise. Like none of your signal is actual signal. And they've been working on it for like two months. So it's one of those things where getting some expert feedback can help you a lot. All right. Good timing. All right, so our, our last exercise um, is going to be to go through and write a couple of user needs and validations, specifications, and, um, <clears throat> and verification tests, and then pick one of those and write a verification protocol, okay, a test protocol. So you're gonna come up with some kind of a test that you're gonna run on some type of James Bond gadget. Now, in the past, I've taken for granted that everybody would know who James Bond was and what a James Bond gadget was. Um, that's not always been true. So if you aren't sure who James Bond is, uh, he's the handsome fellow there in the tuxedo. Um, and he tends to have gadgets that foil bad guys that are chasing him, right? So you, the good examples in the car, he had smoke screen, he had uh, machine guns that come out the side of the car. So if you aren't familiar with what these things are, that's the broad idea. So pick a James Bond type gadget, right? A spy gadget um, and write your user needs and the associated validation, specification, associated verification, and then pick one of them and write a short test protocol. And you've got about 10, 12 minutes to do that. All right, go. You late? Oh, yeah, like doing the notes. Okay. All right, what device did you choose? Mm -hmm. What device did you choose? This is smoke screen. Smoke screen? Yeah. yeah. That's fine. What about you? Machine gun. Machine gun? That's a good one. Courtney, what are you doing? You guys are all picking ones from this movie. Have you never watched James Bond? <laughs> anybody, anybody pick one that wasn't on the, the clip? Exploding watch. Exploding watch, excellent. Who else? I just came to the spy watch. Spy watch? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have any of you ever seen, um, there's, a, there's a newer movie of it, but it was an <clears throat> old TV show, Get Smart. Anybody, so this is, this is a Mel Brooks comedy TV show that's kind of making fun of things like James Bond. But he has a, a shoe phone, and this is way before the invention of the cell phone, right? So he's always taking off his shoe and like talking to the shoe. He's like, I don't, you know, yelling at the shoe, and people are always looking at him like, what a weird guy. It's, so it's like the least subtle spy gadget ever, right? Like, I'm not a spy, I'm just talking to my shoe. Yeah, of course, cell phones, I pretty useful. Yeah, yeah, it would be very useful. Shoe, shoe phone.
Anybody else come up with some good ones that weren't on this clip? What about you guys over here? Anything? Just machine guns? Everybody who likes machine guns? Oh, yeah, the dagger shoe? That's a good one. Laser pen? Yeah. You can invent one that didn't exist if you want to. Pin grenade? That's a good idea. All right, somebody doing the smoke screen, what was your user need? Uh, so you can't identify characteristics of someone after a certain point in time. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. See, it's tricky, right? I wrote the wrong thing, didn't I? It says a spec and a validation protocol, but those don't go together. Yeah. It should be a verification protocol. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you pass. <laughs> So only one person so far has caught my typo. You'll notice it says choose one spec and write a validation protocol. Those two don't go together, right? That's what we just talked about for an hour. So it should be a specification and a verification protocol. Don't get them confused. What'd you pick? What are you working on? Microphone. A microphone? Yeah. Generic microphone? Yeah. Cool. It's exciting. All right, who's, who's written their protocol? Anybody? A couple? All right, I'll give you just a couple more minutes to write your protocol and then we'll trade and grade. Smart. Maxwell's 
smart. He's an 86. Hello, Chief. Max, what's up? Chaos, eh? All right, you get the idea. Very subtle, right? <laughs> Be easier to pull your cell phone out. Uh, but this was, I think, in the 1870s, a so little, little before modern cell phone technology. Okay, so um, who wants to share their protocol, test protocol? Nobody? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so like the stuff I would go to test my specification. Yeah, but, but nice and loud, nice and loud for all okay, your phones. So the product is like a GPS stress signal watch, so if I get caught, I can send out a stress signal GPS to home base and they know my location. So one of the specifications is it should be water resistant up to 50 meters. So like if I get submerged, because I'm James Bond, I <laughs> might end up in some sort of shark tank somewhere. <laughs> it should still be able to work after getting wet and getting down to pressures of 50 meters depth. So what you could do is you could take a uh, some sort of, I don't know of any tool that does this, but there probably is one some sort of pressure testing chamber with water in it and you test the pressure of depth at 50 meters under with the watch inside the box and make sure it still works after being subjected to that amount of stress. Very good. All right, did everybody follow that? Okay, so the one thing I'd just add is when writing the protocol, you want it to be really step by step. So like step one, you may have to create your device first, right? Your testing chamber, but you know, it'd be like step one, put it in the chamber. Step two, increase the pressure to this. Right, and then right, and then say leave it there for however long it needs to be, or run it through so many cycles of doing that. Right, so good one. Anybody else? Pi camera. Pi camera. Okay. Pi with a camera in it. Okay. And what what test are you running on your Pi? Okay, so you're, you're going to put it in a conspicuous place and see if someone notices the pie has a camera in it. Okay, you may want to do a taste test, make sure it's all right. All right, I think you guys get the idea. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on verification and validation? No? Okay. Have any of you tested any of your Epix projects yet? Yes. Okay, yes, I know you have. Anybody else? So one thing I would, I would advise you, don't wait in your projects. Start running your verification tests until you're done. Right? So that's a fool's errand. It, you should test as soon as you know what a specification is and you have a design output that meets it, right? So if you create a prototype, it's a good idea to run your tests early on so that if you have failures, you find them and cor correct for them early. Or if you wait until the very end and you're like, I've got my final thing done, I'll run my tests now. You've really invested a lot of time and effort to get to that point. So the earlier you can run them, the better. So likewise, when we talked about risk analysis a lecture or two ago, you want to run those risk analysis as soon as you have specifications. Run these tests as soon as you start to have outputs from those specifications, right? So test early and test often. All right. Uh, so again, make sure you got 1A marked on your Scantron. Uh, you can leave those by the last desk on the outside. And have a great week. Good luck in your design reviews.